In fact, uh, we are getting scientific fact now that it is very addictive. Um, the THC in marijuana has skyrocketed. It's no longer the marijuana that the hippies used to smoke in the 1960s. In fact, Mr. President, uh, the marijuana that we used to smoke would make you laugh and giggle. No one's laughing and giggling about the THC that's 27 and sometimes 34, 35%. Now, it is an absolute drug. And it's a gateway on two levels. One, it is the first drug that our youth will try. And so what does it do? It breaks the seal of addiction in the minds of the youth. It introduces their mind and their body to getting high. Isn't that amazing? And so therefore, there's no turning back. Now they have the feeling of getting high, becoming intoxicated with the dope, and so that will lead them to a harder drug because marijuana won't do it for them anymore. And number two, it's a gateway drug because the Drug Policy Alliance and individuals that want to see all drugs legalized in the state of California is using marijuana and trying to legalize marijuana to legalize other drugs. And so marijuana is a very, very dangerous drug, and that's the reason why the federal government continues to say it's a Schedule One drug, and that's the reason why the FDA will not approve it for medicine. Do you think it will be approved in the future? No way possible. Absolutely not. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And well the said. epidemic of marijuana among our youth um, is amazing. It's just amazing to see our youth. Here's the question, sir. How do you educate an intoxicated mind? You just cannot. So we need to get that under control. And we need to help a faith base. And we need to help of this nation. N the main reason we want our youth to have an opportunity to have a great future. This educating an intoxicated mind reminds me we live in San Francisco Giants territory and one of their fans took a pretty severe beating by some people in Los Angeles several weeks ago who were the un under the influence of alcohol, of course. Um, do we do we surrender at some point and just say this is what everybody's doing or do we keep up the good fight? Well, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the example is this. We made alcohol legal and we have uh, almost a half a million deaths per year with alcohol. We made tobacco legal and we have almost a half a million deaths with tobacco. And now the drugs are, uh, Gil Kronokowski came out last week and said the drug that most people are overdosing on is pharmaceutical drugs. We made uh, pills legal, excuse me, did I say illegal? We made pills legal and alcohol and tobacco legal. And now it's the worst in the world. If we make marijuana legal, it's not going to decrease um, the usage, it's going to increase the usage, such as it did with making tobacco legal, alcohol legal, and pharmaceutical drugs legal. To answer your question, no, sir. We keep up the good fight because we're going to win. We're in it together. Yes, sir. We're in it. Yes, sir. Let's change subjects, topics just a little bit and move to Oak Park where you grew up. I'm well aware that you're involved in a take back Oak Park uh, initiative or work. Will you comment on that, please? Yes. We, uh, we love Oak Park. And at one time, Oak Park was a beautiful neighborhood. And in fact, it's the oldest neighborhood in the Sacramento area. Right now, you can walk in Oak Park and buy any drug you want. And the murders in Oak Park are horrendous. What we've decided to do is to take a real close look at Oak Park and see if we can be a great help to them. And we believe we can be a help to Oak Park. We need Oak Park to thrive. We need Oak Park to be the neighborhood that it used to be. And with the help of faith base and individuals like you and, and our uh, city council, um, we have decided that we are going to take back Old Park and we're not going to quit, we're not going to stop and we're not going to faint, we're not gonna give up. We are going to absolutely turn that underserved community around. What happened in Oak Park that other neighborhoods might avoid? 
What happened in Oak Park was the community stopped caring. Well said. They stopped caring and the neighbors stopped caring about each other and they allowed gangs to come in and dope to come in and the corrosion became so ingrained and so deep that now um, they didn't know how to get out and it just went across the whole Oak Park community. What I would say to other communities, meet your neighbors, care about each other. It doesn't matter what religion they might be, or what their faith might be, what their creed might be, what their uh, background might be. Uh, that's your neighbor. It's about humanity. Meet your neighbor, shake their hand. And those that uh, seem to want to bring drugs and dope and gangs in the community, you have to get rid of them. You have to get, get them out of the neighborhood. If you don't do it quickly, you too will have a dead community. I graduated from a high school that had 300 kids in it. And with the exception of a couple of Native Americans, we were all Caucasian. We came to California 30 years ago and our children graduated from high school with 2,500 kids in it. One of the things my wife and I noticed was there was no color or dress code or any of those other things. They just all liked each other. You and I listened to a woman say the other day in school that when a child is reacting to another, they just say that boy over there in a red shirt. Um, is that going to get better in neighborhoods as we go along or will we still battle that? It will take the complete neighborhood. It was said at one time and it is still true, but I wanna take it a little further. It takes an entire community to raise a child. But who is going to educate the community is our concern. Our communities must become educated. And we need the parents to pay attention to the children. And when they see the red or the blue, when they see what looks like gang activities, do not be afraid to talk to your child. If you're afraid to talk to your child, you might call me one day to bury them. And unfortunately, I have to look in many coffins of many young people. What a crazy ideal for Afro-Americans, especially, who are 80% of the incarceration, to have war on their own community because someone is wearing blue and someone is wearing red. Let me speak directly, Mr. Fish, to the Afro-American community. We are absolutely losing another generation. We cannot afford to kill each other. When you and I met at another gathering some months ago and talked about these kinds of issues, um, the African-American leaders were open and honest and fair and just, and I was very, very impressed, wondering at what point in time, though, will we cross the color lines and just be Ron and John? Is that going to happen in our lifetime? You know, I, I think it will. I think with people like you and I that are standing side to side against all criticism, but uh, seeing great results, and we have the correct message that this is not about white or black or Christian or Protestant or Jew. This is about humanity. And finally, finally, the message is resonating among other religions and other cultures. And we're seeing that start right here in Sacramento. So I believe we're not wasting our time. It will happen and you and I will see it in our lifetime. It feels good and it feels right and as I said earlier, we're together. We talked earlier about homicides and murders in California and in the nation. Will you comment a little bit about Sacramento? And we've talked about burying children and the other things that unfold there. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing and shocking that uh, Sacramento is the number two murder 
city in the state of California next to Oakland, California. Number two, I never thought that we would ever see this particular day. We have to pay attention to our youth. The majority of individuals that are dying on our street are young adults and youth. And most of the killings are over, some drug deal going bad, or some turf war. And so I know we want our professional basketball team to stay in Sacramento, but to my heart, there's something more important. Kings, I love you very much, and I hope you stay, but I think that we need to pay attention to the murders that are happening in the Sacramento area. How can we help the churches and the houses of worship increase the focus and the awareness on these issues? We can't stay in our four walls. Those faith-based leaders have to cross the line, cross, let down the walls, begin to understand the different religions and embrace each other so that we can walk hand in hand. If we don't do that, we will destroy each other. And so it should behoove us. And I encourage every faith-based leader, come out of your citadel, let down your barrier, break out the walls, and go meet your faith-based leader in your community. Go meet the Sikh and the Baptist and the Catholic and the Muslim and the Buddhist and embrace them. And you'd find out that you would have a better world to live in and a greater community that will be in so much focus. And is that uh, the greatest spiritual need in America as you see it, is to simply step out and get closer to one another? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. I'm a Christian, and following the teachings of Jesus and following the teachings of the Holy Bible, it says that it's not God's will that any man should perish. What does that simply mean to us? It's that we need to embrace each other, we need to help each other, we need to love each other, and we need to not see each other as a religion, but as a human being, and begin to understand each other so that we can have a wonderful life on this earth. It's okay for individuals to be different. It's all right. In fact, it's wonderful. And I'll say this, I just wouldn't want everyone to be like Ron Allen. I think it would be a terrible world. We have been visiting with Bishop Ron Allen, who is a Baptist minister and the leader of the Interfaith Coalition. Um, I've said that wrong, so I need to start over. The International, International Faith Base, sorry. We have been visiting with Bishop Ron Allen, who is a Baptist minister and the president and CEO of the International Faith Base Coalition. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Mr. Fish. We love you very much, sir. Thank you.